Thank you, Akemi. Thank you so much for joining us today. How I started collecting Chinese children's hats is a story of serendipity. I purchased 10 hats from one estate and was so delighted with them when they arrived that I was instantly hooked by their colorful charm. When I began collecting these whimsical hats, I had no idea how rich a subject this would be to research and how much culture and artistry is reflected in these hats. I look forward to adding to my collection and learning more about this unique art form. Now sit back and let me help you unlock your inner child. Children are the most precious gifts given to mothers and families. The birth of a child is a happy and festive event. As the Chinese consider the head an important part of the body, it must be well protected at all times. Children's hats did not just protect from cold, heat, and wind, but were designed and decorated to be whimsical works of art. Embroidery is one of China's ancient handicrafts, and Chinese mothers use great imagination in making colorful hats for their children. My photos include close-ups of embroidery on textiles in my collection, as well as the hats themselves. Chinese children's hats are categorized in two distinct groupings, both of which are represented in my collection. The most predominant are the Han hats, and the second group is found among the more than 50 ethnic minority peoples in Southwest China. The purposes of these lovingly created hats are the same, no matter the origin. That is to protect from evil spirits, demons, and ghosts and to infuse the child with wealth, health, courage, academic success, happiness, long life, grace, and beauty. My hats date from the early 20th century to 1950. Han hats are from the four northern provinces of China. They are usually made of silk and or satin and feature elaborate satin stitch embroidery and applique work. Round mirrors were sometimes inserted to adorn the hats, and it was thought that the mirrors would reflect evil away. Ethnic minority hats. There are many ethnic minority peoples in Southwest China such as the Miao, the Dong, Yi, and Bai. I am not an expert in identifying which tribe a hat can be attributed to. So for the purposes of this talk, I will refer to non-Han hats as minority hats. Minority hats are usually made of cotton or hemp and sometimes indigo dyed. They feature lots of silver and faux jade and coral ornaments, colorful beads and hand cut and drilled sequins. The Chinese believe silver and gold possess invisible vapor. So silver ornaments were stamped out of thin sheets and in the shape of Buddhist deities and the Taoist eight immortals. They were sewn to the front of the hat to ward off evil and dispel misery and unhappiness. Their embroidery features unique stitches such as coiled or bullion-like stitches. And here you can see the bullion type of stitching. And they love their pom-poms. These are little shoes that were often made to go along with the children's hats. There are many popular animals for the hats. Some of them are mythical creatures like dragons and phoenixes. As the mythical dragon is a sign of good luck, the Chinese like to name their children and grandchildren dragon. There are many kinds of dragon. The dragon king of the seas produces rain, and wind, the water dragon sometimes brings floods, celestial dragon protects the mansions of the gods, the winged dragon channels floodwaters back to the sea, 
and the yellow dragon presents elements of writing. The dragon symbolizes the essence of yang or maleness. The Miao minority believe that all life is equal and all things have a living soul. Thus, the Miao dragon, while they're flying or coiled, is not a symbol of imperial power, but of life and strength in the heavens and the earth. And the motif can be used without any distinction of class. So you can see the Miao dragons are very unique. So this is the first of the dragon hats. And the hallmark of a dragon hat are the little tusks and the flames on each side of the mouth. The little horns at the top, sometimes hidden by the ears. And they have very plumy tails. You can see that each mother uses incredible imagination on the eyes, the nose, the ears. <laughs> this has a rat on the back net flap. This has got a beautiful lotus and a bird on the back. These little pom-poms are mounted on springs. So as the child is walking, yes, they bounce up and down. This is a rather sleepy eyed dragon. A lot of times they would use other materials from other clothing to line the inside of the hats. This has a lotus flower on the head. This mother used pipe cleaners to make the little tusks and to emphasize the nose a bit more. And the horns actually look like deer horns. You can see fish scales embroidered on the back of this one. This is a headband with the dragon in the front. As you can see, all of these hats were meant to be admired, coming, going, sideways from the top. <laughs> Here's a close-up of the embroidery on the nose and the flames, and you can see the little tusk. Here's the Jimmy Durante of dragons. And you can see this is also has an open top with just the spine going down the top of the child's head. Here you see more pom-poms. This one has a little lizard embroidered on the tongue. The tiger is regarded as the protector of children and is the most beloved decorative motif found on the children's hats, bibs, and shoes. The tiger is meant to frighten off evil spirits and trick them into thinking the child is not human, but an animal. And here you see a tiger bib. 
little tiger shoes, more tiger shoes. So one of the hallmarks of the tigers are, well, this one doesn't have it. I'll show you on the next hat. This is an open top hat. And you can see it has a dragon nose with the little cat-like ears. One of the hallmarks of a tiger hat is the tail is very different. The tail looks very cat-like, which I will show you in the next hat. This is one of the smallest hats I own. It's probably three inches in diameter, and it features a small tiger on the front. And from the back, you can see it has different embroidery on the feathers. And the headband has a dog at each end. So the tiger hats have the Wong character on the forehead and, it be, and the character means king as the Chinese thought of the tiger as the king of beasts. And the tiger hats, the tail is very different. It's a very much more cat-like tail. This is an ethnic minority tiger hat. You can see it's made of cotton and very different um, tiger face. Another minority hat. This tiger has, instead of your usual spots, it has eyes. This tiger has a lotus on his forehead and a beautiful cloud motif down the back of the hat. This is another headband, another tiger with the eyes as spots. A little dog on the back flap with the bat. This tiger has a butterfly on the top. This is an elaborate tiger. He has a crane coming over his forehead. This is a fun headband. You have mommy tiger in the front and there's a baby on each side of the headband. This little hat has a lot going for her. She's got tassels and pom-poms and flowers and this mother wasn't taking any chances. These are pomegranates on the back. Another girl's headband. I love this tiger hat so much. She made the front cover of my book that I self-published in 2020. This is a child's collar and you can see a number of little tigers hanging down. This one's shy, his ears are covering his eyes. This one's missing his ears entirely. This is a very wide toothed tiger. I mean, and it's hard to see, but the head is actually mounted on a pretty heavy spring. So the whole head bounces up and down when the child walks. This is one of my favorite tigers because he looks good coming and going. Love the caterpillar eyebrows. 
Now the whiskers on this tiger are made out of horsehair. They're very, very stiff. This tiger has little heart ears and a lotus on the back and a lovely spiral design on the top. This is a close-up of a child's bib. You can see a little boy and a tiger. This tiger hat has a butterfly on the top and a bat on the back. Another toothy tiger. All of this is not embroidered. This is all drawn on, probably with something similar to Sumier ink. This tiger has a toad on top, and the mouth actually opens. This tiger has little stars on his butt, very festive. Again, all of the detail is drawn on in ink. This is a tiny, probably a newborn hat. It's again, about three inches in diameter. It's very tiny. So uh, the two tiger hats, I mean, why have one tiger when two work even better? So generally you would have one tiger facing forward and you can see the side and the back and you have another tiger face on the top of the hat facing upwards. So the idea is to repel evil from all directions. This is another two tiger hat. Here's the front and here's the top. Lions are not indigenous animals to China. They were brought into China during the Tang Dynasty as tribute and used for court entertainment. This tradition continues to the present day. During festivals, there are dancing lions which symbolize joy. The lion is a symbol for power and courage. So this is an ethnic minority lion hat. It's made with cotton, with all kinds of cotton for the mane. This is a book from my personal library and inside it features some pages showing women actually making these hats for sale to tourists. You can see them assembling it and there's a the finished product at the end. This is another minority lion hat. You've got lions in the front, lion on the top, lions on the back. And on the back flap, you have rats. The phoenix, the mythical phoenix, has the throat of a swallow, the wings of an eagle, neck of a snake, crown of a male mandarin duck, forehead of a crane, stripes of a dragon, eyes of a man, brow of a swallow, back of a tortoise, and the tail of a fish. From the front, it looks like a wild swan, and from the back, a unicorn. Its song contains five notes. 
and its feathers are five colors representing good morals, propriety, justice, benevolence, and trust. The phoenix only eats bamboo. The phoenix is also a symbol of yin or femaleness. You can see the phoenixes on the top of this champion hat. This phoenix um, is very stiff paper that's been covered with fabric and then embroidered over. This, all the pieces on this hat were salvaged from a really damaged hat. And so I just apply them to a modern 1950s turban because I hate to waste stuff. And now it's wearable again. And all of this is paper that was embroidered over. The minority Chinese believe not in the Phoenix, but the GU fairy bird. And the fairy bird played a role in helping mother butterfly create human beings. And I'll get more to that later when we get to the butterflies. But you can see the GU bird here and here. This is an ethnic um, men's festival jacket. This is a boy's jacket. And here you see the GU bird again. and on the front of this ethnic hat. The crane symbolizes longevity. Here you see cranes hanging from an adult's collar. A crane hanging over the forehead of a tiger. This is an ethnic hat. You can see the difference in the embroidery and the hand stamp sequins. This is all pieces that I salvaged from a damaged hat and I actually made the base to attach everything to. So you can see the crane's head and the wings and the tail. And I was able to salvage two flowers to put on the back of the hat. Fish is a homonym for the word plenty and jade. A common saying at New Year is, may gold and jade fill your house. The legend about the carp teaches about perseverance and beating all odds as the carp swims up the Yellow River, reaches the Dragon Gate waterfall, and is then transformed into a dragon. This is a metaphor for a scholar passing the imperial examinations. Goldfish were kept either inside the house or outside in ponds and represents abundance of gold and jade. This is a marvelous golden carp. His scales are actually paper that are stuffed with a cotton-like fabric. And these scales are also paper stuffed with cotton. You can see the faux hair in the back here so that, you know, for all those bald babies, they still had some hair, even if it was on their hat. These fish are rescued from a damaged hat. They're beautiful carp facing each other. And I was able to find a pink 1950s bonbon hat that this exactly fit on. This is one of my favorite hats to wear. Here we have another goldfish with the cranes on each side. And look at the marvelous workmanship on the back, the fins. This is an ethnic hat. It's made with cotton. The butterfly, the Chinese words for cat and butterfly sound the same as the two words for longevity. 
The butterfly is the symbol of joy and summer, and when shown in pairs, it's a symbol of marital happiness. Here you see a butterfly bib. The Meow have their own origin story. They believe they are descended from Mother Butterfly. According to legend, a butterfly was born from the trunk of a maple tree, and she fell in love with the sea foam. She then laid 12 eggs, 11 of which turned into the various elements of heaven and earth. But the 12th egg remained unhatched, so the butterfly asked the fairy bird, Jiyu, to help incubate the egg. And, and from that, the first human being was born. The Meow believe the butterfly represents fertility, protection, and strength. This motif is frequently used not only on baby hats, but also on baby carriers to protect and bless the children. So the ethnic minorities use a very um, different butterfly motif. They use butterflies a lot in their silver jewelry also. This one, believe it or not, is a butterfly. Bats are clever and industrious. The bat is often shown hanging upside down, meaning good fortune has arrived. And two bats facing each other represent double luck. Here you have a bat with a little ox. Yes, I know he's missing an eye. Here you have a bat on the neck flap of the hat. A bat on a pagoda style champion hat. And this is my favorite bat hat, which you'll see me wearing later after the slideshow is over with. Here's the front and the top and the back. This bat hat has a little tiny tiger on the top. The rooster. It is thought that when he crows, evil spirits run away. This is probably the oldest piece in my collection. It's from the late 1800s. It is a full length robe with a rooster on the back and the front. This is an ethnic rooster hat. It's made with cotton dyed in indigo. It's covered in silver and shells and there's pom pom in the front. Another ethnic rooster hat. It's a very different style with this has faux coral and faux jade in the front. And this one is also covered in silver. The rat, he is clever and industrious. Here we have King Rat himself with a very festive red tail. This is a picture showing the Rat Daughter's wedding. Once upon a time in a village of rats, a couple had a beautiful daughter who they loved very much. When it came time for her to be married, 
her parents wanted to marry her to the most powerful being. So they first went to ask the sun. However, the sun said, I'm not the most powerful because clouds can block me. So the rats went to the cloud and asked him to marry their daughter. The cloud refused saying that I'm not the most powerful because the wind can blow me away. Rats went to see the wind. Wind replied, he was also not the most powerful because a, a wall can block him. The rats went to find the wall. The wall told them the rat would be more powerful because he can chew a hole in it. Uh, then the rats thought, well, they should marry their daughter to the cat because they were afraid of him. So on the third day of the Chinese New Year celebration, the rats happily married their daughter to the cat. However, the cat began to eat the rats participating in the ceremony of possession. This was not a happy ending. Here you see a rat face with the champion hat above. This is a minority hat with rats on the side. And this is another rat hat with an elaborate neck flap. The five noxious animals. The snake, scorpion, centipede, spider, and toad are the five noxious animals. It was believed these creatures would have the neutralizing effect of fighting poison with poison. And here you see some minority vests with the five noxious animals. The spider, the upside down spider represents blessings coming from above. And here you see a spider. It's hard to tell because she's missing some of her legs, but she's a spider nevertheless. The three-legged toad. You've all heard of the story of the goose that laid the golden egg. Well, we have a toad here that spits coins. And he also looks like a very, very chubby coin purse. The centipede. Um, you saw earlier on some of the tiger hats that the centipede was hand drawn in ink down the back to form the spinal column. The snake. Here you see a snake coiled around the feet of a tiger. Scorpion. This is such a gorgeous hat, but when you look closely amongst all the flowers and pretty things are a scorpion and a rat. Oh, hey, another scorpion. The rabbit. A Chinese folk tale tells of the rabbit who resides in the moon pounding the elixir of immortality. This potion was seen as having healing and protective powers while the rabbit represented wishes for longevity. In the past, the term for the moon was the jade hair. According to legend, at the age of 500 years old, the rabbit's fur turned white and it lived over 1,000 years. Here we have a golden bunny with a beautiful peony in the front. Here's the side and back. Here's the 500 year old bunny. <laughs> and another golden bunny. The pig symbolizes abundance, wealth, and sumptuousness. The Chinese character for home is a pictogram showing a pig under a roof. 
Having a pig in your home was a guarantee of food throughout the year. The elephant represents stability. And here's a dog hat with an elephant as his nose. The ram was considered auspicious as it was often sacrificed with prayers for good fortune and served as currency. This is a headband with a ram on the front and another headband. The dog is the emblem of faithfulness and guardianship as dogs are considered loyal and temperate. And here's the dog hat with the elephant nose. Many plants and flowers were used on these hats. The first one we'll talk about is the peony. The peony is a native flower of China and is called the king of flowers and the flower of riches. There are more than 180 varieties of the peony. Mothers who embroidered, embroidered the peony motif on their daughter's hats wished them to be as lovely and as engaging as Yang Guifei, one of the most beautiful, famous beauties in Chinese history. The lotus is the sacred flower of Buddhism. It symbolizes purity, innocence, fertility, continuity, and prosperity. The lotus flower seeds, fruits, and flowers simultaneously. This entire hat is a lotus flower. And on the top, you'll see a little boy holding on to a bunny who has managed to steal a turnip from the garden. And you can see on the top of this lotus hat is the little tiger. Here it is drawn on the side of this tiger hat. Here is a minority hat with the lotus flower on the front and also drawn on the top. Another minority hat. The orchid is the symbol of purity and nobility. For you orchid fans out there, these are dendrobians. The petal hat. As you can see, it's made of numerous pieces that are assembled to the top and the sides of the hat. This has a butterfly on the back and faux jade and silver on the front. This one features an old mirror on the front. Again, to ward off, reflect off evil. This is a unique uh, petal hat because I've never found one since that has crochet on the top. So it's kind of unique that way. The pomegranate came to China from Mongolia in the Han Dynasty. 
When mature, it is a fresh red color and full of seeds. The seed is a homonym for child, so full of seeds means full of children. Here you see the pomegranate on the neck flap. Many different characters were used on Chinese children's hats. You have the double happiness, which means harmony, balance, and completeness. The yin yang. Cloud motif. The four character. This symbol is called a four character symbol by the ethnic minorities and is included with great frequency in their embroidery. Based on museum collections worldwide, this symbol exists in almost every civilization. For example, in Sanskrit, it means conducive to well being. In Buddhism, it represents the Buddha's footprints. And in Hinduism, it portrays opposites such as light and darkness or two thunderbolts. The spiral is used a lot in ethnic embroidery. This is a close up from a ethnic robe. Here you can see the spiral used on an ethnic hat. And on the side of this rooster hat, so among the embellishments that mothers like to use are the young balls. And the young balls were made of cotton, silk, and stuffed with wool. They came in many sizes and could either be hanging down from the sides or attached to springs on the top of the hat. Tassels were made of thin multicolored thread and hung from the back and sides of the hat. Some tassels are very long and others look like grain or wheat stalks and represent long life. Sometimes a string of old coins were stitched onto a child's hat. And when a baby is 100 days old, a gold, silver, or copper 100 family lock charm is hung around the baby's neck. Smaller versions were often sewn onto the child's hat, as you will see here. You see all the Buddhist deities lined up on the front and bells on the side. This is another ethnic hat. Here you see more of the silver bells. This makes a lot of noise when the child wears it. There are various shapes of child hats. The circle hat is an open top hat. They were most often worn at home and were embellished with flowers or birds or butterflies in this case. The ethnic minorities love their pom poms. The round bowl hat is shaped like a bowl, similar to a skull cap. Unlike the skull cap, the bowl hat is made up of eight 
to 12 small pieces of embroidered cloth sewn together. A silk or cotton ball may be attached to the top, or in this case, lots and lots of tassels. Here's an ethnic uh, bowl hat. Another ethnic hat with the silver. The champion or scholar hat. It is a very elaborate hat taking on many shapes. These are called eagle wings and it was made to mimic an adult's scholar hat. And it was thought that these stylized eagle wings indicate the wearer will soar like an eagle to unknown heights. It's a different shape champion hat or scholar hat. This is the front and the back, the same hat. Here is a pagoda-like sh shaped champion scholar hat. Here is an ethnic scholar hat. You can see the distinctive embroidery. The wind hat. A special feature of the wind hat is the back flap that covers the back of the head and the neck, protecting the child's ears and neck from the cold air. You'll see on the Han hats that the neck flap is long and covers all the way down to the bottom of the neck. This is bunny fur. This is an ethnic wind hat. You can see that the back neck flap is shorter and it flares slightly. The Taoist hat. The eight symbols chase away evil and misfortune and bring good luck. Each symbol represents one of the seven males and one female who represent the Taoist ideals of immortality. The sky top hat. It's a hat high enough to reach to heaven. Many layered decorative pieces pile up on the top, forming a mini crown. It illustrates the saying, may you continuously rise in rank. The silver festival hats are worn by the ethnic minorities for the Lunar New Year and other festivals throughout the year. This is a gorgeous peacock. Here you see him from the side and the front and you see all the fish hanging down and look at this tail. Just amazing work and it's very heavy. <laughs> this is a set of double birds and a horse and riders go all the way around the edge of the uh, hat. Here's another set of double birds facing each other. So I'm gonna end with pictures of children actually wearing these hats.
And for the kid at heart, people often ask, do I wear these hats? And the answer is, yes, I do. Okay, that brings us to the end of my presentation. Thank you so much, Terry. I enjoyed watching the slide. I can't, I can't believe how much fun it was to watch that slideshow. There were so many different hats, I lost count. How many do you have in your collection? Currently, it's 163. Wow. <laughs> how, many, how many did you share with us today? All of them. That's amazing. Yeah, I know. It's, it's going to get to a point where it won't all fit in our presentation, but hey, yeah, <laughs> we're well, not I'm, there yet. <laughs> I'm so glad you uh, you have a book. Um, you do. Yes. And... Um, did you have a slide with your contact information for your book? No, I forgot to put it up, but I can show you what the book looks like to start with. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> right. And um, people can contact me at my email address. And my email is tweagle at atp.net. And if you want to email me, I can give you the particulars. The books are $20. Okay, that's great. Um, well, if you don't mind, I'd like to ask uh, a couple of questions of you that we received from our live audience. Oh, good. Yes, um, please. Right. Okay, so the first question was, um, how do you start collecting these hats? It was totally by accident. I mean... I happened to see a lot of 10 of them for sale on eBay and I offered the woman a reasonable price. And when they came, I was just hooked. I mean, each one was more, more whimsical than the next. And then my curator from, from the Asian art museum came to my house one day and showed me how to restore some of them. Cause you know, some of the hats like the sky top hats that have that little mini crown on the top, one of the hats came and that crown was completely squashed. And so she was showing me how to to rework it so that it would be a crown again. Oh, that's great. So um, the next question that I want to ask you is, what price range would you expect to pay for these hats? Uh, the prices have gotten a little bit ridiculous. I mean, I would say that I don't usually pay any more than 50 to to $100 for a hat. When it goes over that price, I, I pass. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because some of the hats now they listed for two, three, four hundred dollars. Like, no, no. <laughs> oh, that would be on eBay. That's on eBay, but even trade shows mark up the prices also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, how do you store your hats? I do have them stored in plastic bins, and I keep lavender sachets in there to keep the buggies away. And I do open the bins at least once a year to air them out and make sure. Nothing snuck in there that I don't know about. And um, some of them are stuffed with paper, you know, to maintain their shape. Some of them can be stored flat. It just depends on the type of hat. Okay. Um, are you still building your collection then? I am, but it's slowed down quite a bit because with 163 hats, I have almost every type of hat, several several models of each different kind of hat. So I'm being more, more particular about what I'm going to buy now. Okay. Well, if our viewers want to see more children's hats, are there any museums that, that have child's hat collections? The Chinese Historical Society in San Francisco has hats in their collection, but they don't have them out on permanent display. Mm -hmm. And um, there are other museums. Hang on. There are other museums in the world that have um, Chinese textile things. There's one in Singapore, the Sun Yat-sen Museum. In Canada, in Toronto, there's a textile museum of Canada that has, I believe, over 100 hats that someone donated. But again, they don't have them on permanent display. Mm. So those are the only three that I know of so far where you can maybe see these hats. Okay. 
I'd like to ask you a couple of questions about how the hats were used. So why did, why did the mothers make animal hats? Well, you know, they wanted to fool evil spirits into thinking their kid was an animal. Uh -huh. so, that, so that's, you know, so that's, you know, the whole idea with the bulgy eyes and, you know, the overly large, like some, some of the tigers, the overly large mouth, you know, with the big fierce looking grin and stuff. Um, it was all meant as a, as a ploy to try to disguise their babies as animals so that, you know, evil spirits will move on. <laughs> so, so, um, did they make, a, I'm, I'm sort of being gender biased here. Did they do um, animals for just the boys or boys and girls? Um, you know, were there different motifs favored for the different genders? Um, in general, the animal hats were made for the boys and the floral ones for the girls, but there's some overlapping. You know, a lot of times, sometimes they'll make a headband for a girl that has animals on it. So it just really was left up to the discretion of the mothers. Right. So um, on what occasions were the hats worn? Were these elaborate creations worn every day uh, or were they saved for special occasions? They were definitely saved for special occasions. Yeah, because so much work went into them and they took so long to make. I mean, in between all the other duties that a mother would have to do that there's no way she was going to let the child drag it through the mud. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. So um, when does a child stop wearing the hat? Probably when they outgrow it. Or in my case, since I have a little head, uh -huh. I wear it all the time. <laughs> right. I have no shame. <laughs> right. Right. So um, what parts of China? Now, I think you, you said that um, most of the hats we saw, the ones that were more... Um, um, that had references to animals or flowers or specific things. Now, those were the ethnic hats, right? No, the um, the ethnic hats are the ones that were made out of cotton or corduroy or velvet. And the Han hats had all the elaborate satin embroidery uh, on it, and they were made out of silk. Oh. So that's the main difference between the two. And also, the ethnic hats tended to have more silver silver pieces on the front, and it, and and the Han hats did not. Okay, so you wouldn't be able to say, oh, look, it's a tiger hat. I know it's an ethnic minority hat because both groups made the tiger hats. They did, but the differences were the materials, the base materials they used for the hat. The Han hats were primarily made with silk and satin, and ethnic hats were primarily made with cotton, sometimes dyed indigo cotton or just, you know, whatever cotton material they had on hand. Right. Okay, so I'm going to ask you kind of, um, do you have... Do you have children? I do. Okay. So have you, have they been influenced by your hat collecting? I'm afraid not. <laughs> okay. I mean, my children appreciate the fact that I want to keep this piece of my culture alive. Um, but other than that, they, they have no other, I mean, they find it amusing, mm -hmm. but other than that, they're, they're, it's not a huge not a huge piece of interest for them. Right. And one more kind of personal question. Has collecting the hats given you insights into China that you didn't have before? It's given me insight into a China that no longer exists. You know, um, most of my hats date to the early 20th century before World War II, before communism took over and before the whole purging of the artists and stuff. So, you know, once you know, the, the country opened up a little bit and they realized they could make money selling hats similar to this to the tourists. They started encouraging a lot of the ethnic minorities to make the hats, but, you know, the workmanship is nowhere close to the way it was. Right. You know, they're just kind of like putting them together fast and, you know, and not spending that much time on that. I mean, that one lion hat that I think I showed some pages from the book of it being made. I mean, you could see it was just like a cookie cutter thing where they're assembling them just, just to sell to the tourists. I mean, right. Yeah. Right. I mean, definitely not the same kind of care with the embroidery and selection of fabrics that was done in the past. Right. So um, Terry, I want to thank you for sharing with us <laughs> A piece of history um, that you've made possible for us to appreciate through your collecting and now through your book. Um, it's just 
really revelatory to see all of these um, abstract symbols like, you know, the cloud and the double lightning and all these mm -hmm. animals just um, interpreted by people for, for use in their everyday lives. So thanks very much for that. Oh, you're very welcome. It was my pleasure today. <laughs>